The Cambridge Analytica scandal that broke in 2018 marked a turning point in the debate about online privacy. The personal data of more than 80 million Facebook users had been harvested and used without their consent or knowledge. The fallout for the companies was immense. Facebook lost more than $100 billion from its market capitalization within days. Cambridge Analytica would eventually close altogether. At the heart of the scandal were online targeted advertisements. In this case, political ads. Cambridge Analytica used Facebook users' data in order to sway their vote to the benefit of Donald Trump, and the company was eager to glorify their work, opening their doors to CNN and other outlets in the days ahead of the 2016 election. Meet Donald Trump's mind readers quietly crunching away 5,000 pieces of data about every American adult. And their aim, to persuade you to vote for Donald Trump with political ads that match your personality. But more than three years after the scandal became mainstream news and Facebook and others pledged to do more to protect users' data, very little has actually changed. Online platforms are still awash in targeted advertisements, both political and commercial and they still use the data of internet users without making them aware of it or getting their consent. The EU is in the middle of negotiations on legislation that could bring new regulations to online advertising. But if this will actually happen, and how it will happen, remain open questions. The human rights situation is worsening globally, and that is why it's important that we hold all those accountable that violate human rights. Islam is the real problem that we face in the Netherlands, in France, in Belgium, in all of Europe. The independence of the judges in Hungary is one of the best in the European Union. <laughs> we need the tripod of democracy, respect for human rights, and respect for the rule of law. Welcome to the Speech Bag Podcast by Liberties. I'm Jonathan Day. On this episode, member of the European Parliament Paul Tang of the Netherlands discusses his push to rein in online targeted advertising. He's leading a large cross-party coalition of MEPs in a push to get rid of online targeted ads. Karolina Ivanska, a lawyer for a digital rights group in Poland, talks about her organization's work to protect the data and privacy of Europeans. And Ava Simon, a senior advocacy officer at the Civil Liberties Union for Europe, talks about the specific threats that come from targeted advertising when it's used as a tool by political actors. Targeted advertising relies on our personal data. So it relies on who we are, what we like, what we watch online, how we behave. It relies on constant observation of, of our activity in order to um, come to certain conclusions about us, in order to profile us, so to speak. Karolina Ivanska is a lawyer and policy analyst at Panopticon Foundation, a Polish digital rights organization. Her NGO has studied targeted advertising and is advocating to have it banned at EU level. So based on what we watch, based on what we, what we read, based on how we click, on what we click at what times of the day, um, online companies um, put us into certain categories, uh, give us certain uh, traits that might be true, uh, might be false, but also might touch on certain um, traits that we would rather hide, that we wouldn't likely reveal ourselves. The data collected, and thus the extent of the violation of our privacy, is beyond what many people assume. Paul Tang is a Dutch member of the European Parliament. He leads a coalition of MEPs against targeted advertising, and last June, 503 of 701 MEPs voted for his amendment to ban online targeted advertising in the EU. This makes the Parliament's position clear as the Commission and Council consider the issue. To him, it's both the amount and type of data collected that makes this such an urgent issue. Huge amounts of data are being collected from a variety of sources. We hardly have an overview of how many data there are on us, uh, but don't underestimate it, it's huge. And these also include very uh, personal data, location, uh, where you live, but also your religious beliefs, your political convictions, uh, and so on. So privacy is invaded at a huge scale. 
This data can be used to infer so many things about you, things you never would suspect advertisers could know. Carolina's organization researched one woman's experience with targeted advertisements on Facebook. Joanna, whose name was changed to protect her privacy, was a young mother who struggled with concerns about health and parenting. So she came to us and said that she um, sees a lot of disturbing ads um, online. She's a young mother. She recently had a baby. And before that, she was uh, quite anxious about health, uh, her health, her family's health in general, which only uh, intensified when she lost um, a close person, one of her parents, to cancer. And uh, then when she became mother, a mother, uh, her anxieties about health skyrocketed because then she, you know, also was worried about her baby um, and not only about herself. Pretty soon, Joanna started to notice that she was being shown a disproportionate amount of advertisements related to health and in particular parenting. Things related to infant health, for example, or fundraisers for terminally ill children. Uh, and she uh, wanted to know whether you know, whether this is actually true, that she's indeed seeing so many ads about that, and whether she can do something about it, whether she can basically get rid of that sort of content that was fuel fueling her health-related anxiety. So what we did was that with the help from um, Piotr Sapierzyński, who's a data scientist at Northeastern University, who specializes in interrogating algorithms and algorithmic fairness, what we did, we uh, Joanna provided 2,000 ads that he, she saw on, on Facebook over um, the period of two months. And we analyzed those ads and we saw that the contents of those ads, and indeed we saw that uh, one in five ads was related to health in this very sensitive uh, context of um, uh, parenting. So she saw a lot of um, ads about fundraisers for terminally ill children, as I mentioned, which were then followed almost immediately. It was, it was um, very disturbing uh, by commercial offers for, uh, for, you know, for medical tests, for tests for rare children's diseases, uh, for cancer scanning, and so on. We also discovered that Facebook, um, if, you, if you go to, to, to settings on Facebook, uh, if you find them, it's not so easy to find them. If you go to advertising settings, you can see that there are certain categories that Facebook attributed to you, so-called interests. So what we saw was that she had 21 health-related interests there. So there was stuff like cancer awareness, um, uh, uh, you know, hospice, uh, muscular, uh, I can't remember the name of the, of the disease, but a rare, a rare children's disease, um, a genetic disease, a genetic disorder, something, something like that. Another disturbing finding of the research, the tools Facebook provides users to try to protect their privacy and avoid such content simply don't work. What we tried to do was to switch off each of these categories uh, in the in ad settings and see whether her experience changes, whether she, uh, you know, effectively manages to get rid of those disturbing ads that were fueling her anxieties. And it turned out that uh, at first we did indeed see a change in her experience in a way that she, uh, you know, the, the number of ads about health uh, went down. However, after just a few weeks, they climbed back up basically to the same level uh, as it was at the start. So again, towards the end of the experiment, she was seeing uh, more or less one in five ads about health in the, in children's con uh, in, in the context of, of, of children's health. Then they tried to contact Facebook directly. Under the General Data Protection Regulation, a landmark EU regulation that entered into force in 2018, people in the EU have the right to know who is using their data, which data are being used, and why and how they're being used. So... In theory, Joanna was entitled to a thorough explanation from Facebook. What she and Panopticon got, however, was anything but thorough. It was a very difficult process that took us uh, 
I think uh, six months and we still haven't really learned anything because first we just got responses from a, a bot, you know, that was just responding to us. Oh, thank you. Can, have you tried downloading your data on Facebook? And here's a link to our privacy policy. The problem is that, you know, in, we, we've used all the tools and the answers weren't there. So we wanted an actual explanation in her individual case, what actually happened what data was collected, where, why such assumptions were made about her, why did Facebook decide that she's interested in, you know, genetic uh, diseases, for example. Uh, finally, we managed to get a response from a human. We think it was a human because there was a human, human name attached to it, um, which, however, again, didn't really respond to our questions. It only, you know, copy pasted a lot of responses from a lot of uh, parts of the Facebook privacy policy, but didn't engage with Joanna's individual experience, didn't explain why her data was used. It's hardly surprising that it's so hard to get meaningful information from Facebook on its use of the user's data. MEP Paul Tang says that's because data is at the core of Facebook's business model, a commodity that is absolutely necessary for the company to survive. The business model of Facebook and Google depends on data collecting. That's their stronghold, so to say. Uh, do I expect Google and Facebook to end data collecting even though it's at the heart of their business model? No, you need to regulate it. There's no way they're going to start, they're going to uh, end that on their own because it's the, and they rely, I think uh, Facebook is for 98 and a half percent uh, from its revenue, 98 and a half percent of its revenue comes from advertising. So do I expect them to change? No, I don't. Sorry. Another reason Paul Tang says we need regulatory action against online targeted advertising is because it threatens independent media and, therefore, the richness and plurality of our political debate. We need independence uh, and diverse reporting on news. That's a crucial part of our democracy and how the way public opinion is formed. We always thought that it was important, it still is important, and um, I see that. The monopoly power of Google and Facebook leading to a deterioration of the position of the traditional media. What you see is that um, uh, digital advertising increases. The revenue mainly goes to Google and Facebook. There are there's anecdotal evidence, but it shows that about 50 to 70 percent of the advertising revenue goes to Google and Facebook. So you see the, the revenue from digital advertising growing. Of course, we are going digital, uh, but you see at the same time that the revenue to traditional media are falling and they can't protect themselves because you don't have to be your, uh, uh, you don't have to go to the Guardian site or to the site of Le Monde or the Spiegel to be identified as a reader of Guardian, Le Monde or the Spiegel. Uh, so they can't protect their trademarks. Politically, Tang says that the fight has been hard going, in part because companies like Google and Facebook go all out to convince politicians that it's their targeted advertising methods that protect small and medium-sized businesses. Currently, Facebook is running a huge ad campaign uh, in traditional media, but also on every social media platform, saying they are the champions of the SMEs. Right? Now, and you must say SMEs are... Um, are very popular are the, among the favorites with the members of the European Parliament, especially on the right-hand side of the political spectrum. Eliminating targeted advertising would actually help protect smaller independent news outlets and other SMEs, including advertisers and publishers. Put very simply, um, cut out the middleman. Think about that. So suppose that fit, indeed that's 50 to 70% of the revenue of advertising goes to Google and Facebook cut out the middleman and you realize that both advertisers and publishers are better off without it. The massive invasion of privacy and the misuse of extremely personal information and the very real threat it brings to independent news outlets and small and medium businesses are some of the reasons that MEP Tang and other EU officials are serious about making the online advertising industry safer. But there's another way online targeted advertising is corrosive, not only to our democracy, but to society itself. 
That's Welcome to Facebook by musical artist Brittle Star. As always, it's the element of truth that makes the satire so biting. Facebook force feeds its users content and advertisements that are heavily curated based on each user's personal data, with the aim of keeping them in so-called echo chambers, where they're consuming only viewpoints that they agree with, and which has the effect of making them even angrier and more polarized. We learned from the Brexit vote and also Cambridge Analytica that we all remember, that targeted ads can create political filter bubbles, echo chambers, can divide people and also increase the number of disinformation. And these are very problematic because these all poses threats to democracy. Ava Simon is a senior advocacy officer at the Civil Liberties Union for Europe or liberties. She heads the organization's work around targeted political ads. She says targeted advertising is key for advertisers, especially political actors, to intentionally increase polarization. This is because it allows them to target different messages to different groups. People are targeted by, by, uh, by political advertisements that somehow resonates to their profiles, or when they are they have certain interest in certain uh, topics and they get tailored messages. So what is possible to do with targeting methods is that the same actor can provide to different categories of voters with different messages. So instead of coming up with the, some kind of a consistent agenda to the general public, so people can participate in democratic discourses, people can form their own opinion, people can then cast their vote, so express their, their political preferences and participate in fair elections. Instead, what happens is that they get tailored messages closed in these eco chambers and they, in, in some cases, they are unable to make informed decisions. That's why some organizations, including the Civil Liberties Union for Europe, are focusing their efforts on getting targeted political advertisements banned, instead of working on a total ban of both commercial and political ads. And the EU does appear to be particularly concerned about targeted political ads. They've seen the success of voter manipulation through targeted advertising firsthand. If you think about the Brexit vote that was, that was, that was um, heavily um, affected by targeted online advertisements. Uh, I think Europe has this expertise how, how targeted political messages can distort the outcome of the elections. The next um, European elections is coming um, in 2024. And it seems that the Commission would like to avoid anything that is similar to Cambridge Analytica or the Brexit votes to distort the fair elections. So the, the plan is at the moment that the Commission will publish a, a draft regulation in November about the transparency of targeted political ads just to make sure that people get access to information why, I, why they are targeted, by whom they are targeted, how much spent on Facebook or on, or on you know, any other platforms. So a transparency register will be set up. It will be legally binding obligation for these online platforms. 
A transparency register is a nice start, but it will not necessarily stop the abuse of people's data or the targeted advertising industry itself. It is far from enough. We, we have to go much further than that. First of all, we have to apply the data protection rules, the European data protection rules called GDPR, and possibly new rules would create an environment where people don't get uh, targeted or micro-targeted political advertisements um, on the basis of the personal data. Proponents of banning targeted advertising altogether, like MEP Paul Tang, do not come empty-handed. There's an alternative solution that might be better for all parties, even businesses that use targeted advertising. It's called contextual advertising. Contextual advertisement is where you, for example, you, you look for shoes uh, or you look for sporting shoes, and that's a moment where Nike can offer you an advertisement. No need, no need for personal information. Just it's your your search that that matters. It's like you walk in the street. Uh, well, then you are shopping. Then you get advertisement for uh, for the stores and for shopping for products. Um, and it, the, the the experiments with contextual advertising show that this is much better for uh, for publishers and for advertisers. And that makes sense because Google and Facebook are unnecessary intermediates. Contextual advertising means that internet users are shown advertisements based on where they go online, as Tang compares to walking into shops during actual shopping. If you visit a sports shoe site, you may see ads for sports shoes. This requires no additional personal data from you, and certainly not things like your religion or political preferences. But there are also other options being discussed. Ava Simon says that certain targeted information could perhaps be used, but only the most basic and impersonal data, and, crucially, only if the user consents to its use for advertising. Some people would like to get ads, and this is totally normal. At Liberties, we advocate for a solution where people can consent for getting political ads or any other ads. They can be targeted if they want only if these targeters use the very basic personal data, such as language preferences. So I might want to get some political ads, but I don't want to get an, a, a political ads in Korean for the, for the fact that I don't speak Korean and I don't want to see that. But these are very basic data. So political parties, we believe, can target people above the age of 18 according to language and very broad location data, so basically country-specific. Because if there is a, or maybe, maybe even for local elections, even for you know, a smaller area, but nothing more than that. And Karolina Ivanska says her organization, while believing a total ban might be most realistic and possibly best, sees still another possibility. There is also a second kind of option that is maybe a bit more, um, a bit less radical, although I think the result would be very similar, is to allow a form of personalization that is not invasive. So basically, if I, as a user, um, you know, I have to see ads if I don't want to pay for a service, I, that might be something that we don't really change because I would really have to change a lot of our behavior, something that we go used to for, for many years. But so I could, for instance, say, I actually want to see ads about a certain topic, or I want to see ads uh, that, you know, deal with my interests, or, you know, I want to be able to somehow flag or signal to, to the company that is doing advertising that uh, I am currently, you know, working on my garden, and I would love to see some recommendations or ads for gardening tools. The problem is that now there is no way to actually tell platforms directly, hey, this is what I am interested in. Rather, then they look at what we watch online and they infer, they analyze this, 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 this behavior and they infer that I am interested in gardening. But wouldn't it be easier for me to actually tell them that I want this sort of, uh, you know, products to be advertised to me? The reason why I think... Um, it's problematic that we cannot do it now, is that, you know, they might infer that I'm interested in sport or gardening or fishing or, or whatever, but they might also come to the conclusion that I might have mental health issues. I might have anxiety about something. I might be at a bad period in my life. So it doesn't, so the same mechanism used to advertise gardening tools for me 
could be used to advertise things that actually fuel my anxiety or build on some vulnerabilities that I have. But in this process of inferring things from my behavior um, means that I cannot really control it. But if I actually, as a user, had the possibility to say, this is what I want, this is what I don't want, uh, that could ensure a form of personalization that is on the one hand useful, that could be useful to me as a, as a user, it could be perhaps also useful to advertisers who could actually reach people who have expressed interest in this sort of uh, product. But at the same time, it could, um, you know, completely eradicate this sort of most uh, dangerous, most uh, um, challenging part of advertising, which is, um, you know, inferring things about me that I haven't willingly revealed. Thanks to MEP Tang's work, there is more clarity now on how his colleagues in the parliament feel about targeted advertising. But negotiations are ongoing, with other EU bodies still needing to clarify their positions. But even then, there are other parties to consider, which only illustrates the difficulty in finally banning online targeted advertising. Now we're now in a negotiation within the European Parliament. Then there's the next negotiation that's with the Council, the members, the countries, the member states, uh, and, uh, and the Parliament. So there will be another fight. And if then it's adopted, then we will need to see what the reaction will be on the other side of the Atlantic. Because that's a concern too, right? How will the US lawmakers react to a strong European position? Still, he remains optimistic that change can and will happen. After all, optimism is, as he says, part of his job description. If I'm not optimistic, I'm, I would be in the wrong pro profession. As a politician, you need to be. It's part of your job description to be optimistic. You want to change, and it may not, and you will not reach this change instantaneously from uh, tomorrow. So you need to have sort of endurance, um, and that's that's part of my job description. That's it for this episode of the Speech Bag Podcast by Liberties, a presentation of the Civil Liberties Union for Europe. To stay in the loop about all the latest human rights news and events, become a subscriber at www.liberties.eu.